just start by saying I'm Manisha Sinha and I uh, teach at the University of Connecticut and I'm happy to be here to talk about uh, the history of abolition in the U.S. and in Connecticut in particular uh, and to relate it to the films that you're going to be seeing um, because you will see how uh, the enslaved resisted their conditions um, through several ways and music and 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 song was was one of the most important ways and remains one of the most important contributions of people of African descent to uh, the United States and the world. Um, but in my talk today, I just want to emphasize uh, this issue of slave resistance and how slave resistance must be seen as essential to the history of abolition. And a lot of it comes from my book, The Slave Scores, A History of Abolition, um, where I briefly look at poetry, song, and other artwork, but it is really more of trying to reimagine the history of abolition um, as a history of an interracial radical social movement in which African Americans played a central part. So we normally think of abolition, we think of it as this kind of bourgeois, northern, middle-class white movement. And yes, there were many white abolitionists who inspired through either religion or other uh, ideologies came to abolition. Um, and we know that many of them joined various reform movements like temperance or even Bible societies. But abolition and the women's rights movement, which came out of abolition, uh, were radical movements, and they tended to challenge far more than other religious and moral reform movements uh, the status quo. And two disfranchised groups played a very important part uh, in the histories of abolition and women's rights. One was African Americans, and the other were, uh, of course, women, uh, black and white women. Uh, but uh, what I argue in the book is not just that African Americans or black abolitionists played a central part in the movement, but that they enslaved it. That slave resistance, rather than bourgeois liberalism, is central to understanding the history of abolition. And once we get that basic simple point, we will be able to understand John Brown much better. Because for many Americans, John Brown just comes out of nowhere and they're like, oh, like he's this crazy radical abolitionist. But actually, John Brown comes very much from the traditions of the abolition movement. In my book, I go back to the revolutionary era right up to the Civil War. And I show how slave resistance, whether in the form of rebellions or uh, fugitivity, simply running away for freedom, voting with your freed, uh, played a central role in the making of abolition. You can see that this is true of Connecticut. We often forget that Connecticut, of course, was a slave state, um, especially in the colonial era before it got rid of slavery very gradually through gradual emancipation laws. Uh, one can see colonial uh, slave runaway advertisements from the Hartford Courant. You could just simply uh, go and, and, and get copies of these runaway slave advertisements showing that uh, New England and Connecticut in particular were very much involved in the history of slavery and slave trade in that time. Now, of course, the revolution does make a di difference. Um, the northern states... Uh, starting with Vermont and ending with New Jersey, start getting rid of slavery, either through judicial proclamations, but mostly through gradual emancipation laws, which free children of enslaved rather than enslaved themselves. And there were enslaved people in Connecticut, like Venture Smith, who, of course, wrote his narrative. We often forget that um, there were uh, enslaved people in Connecticut who wrote slave narratives the way Southern uh, slaves did much later on in the 19th century. Uh, and this is my argument that these people like Venture Smith were the original abolitionists. Uh, enslaved people resisting their own slave enslavement were the original abolitionists. Um, they wrote um, narratives that not only detailed their own experiences, but also um, highlighted uh, 
the cruelties of slavery and the arbitrary nature uh, of slavery. And, um, you know, uh, Venture Smith's narrative, uh, as many other slave narratives, the more famous ones like Douglas's, that was, of course, published much later, can be seen as the original sort of literature of the abolition movement. Uh, within, uh, you know, in Connecticut, of course, you had uh, many African Americans who um, protested against slavery in the early eight, late 18th century. You know, there's Phyllis Wheatley in Massachusetts. Um, there's this famous congregational minister, uh, um, Lemuel Haynes, who preached uh, to a white congregation through much of his life in Vermont, but he was actually born in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, and, and Lemuel Haynes wrote uh, pamphlets, poetry, where he highlighted uh, the, the unchristian nature of slavery and the unrepublican nature of slavery with a small r, uh, that this was an anomaly in the uh, new American republic. And he highlighted uh, why southern slaveholders were the quintessential hypocrites when it came to Christianity. Uh, Lemuel Haynes is very influenced by um, certain new divinity scholars in Connecticut. A lot of abolitionists who came out of Connecticut, black and white, are uh, influenced by new divinity theology uh, in notions of disinterested benevolence. One of them, Samuel Hopkins, preaches to enslaved people. Interestingly, he's white and he preached to enslaved people in uh, Rhode Island and became an abolitionist, and Lemuel Haynes is black, and he had a white congregation in Rutland, Vermont, uh, and it just shows you the interracialism of abolition, which was radical in those times, right? When an overwhelming majority of black people are enslaved, and where you had very sort of rigid racial segregation socially and otherwise. There are other uh, uh, interesting figures who wrote their narratives and came out of uh, slavery in Connecticut. One of them was James Mars, who actually published his uh, narrative only during the Civil War. But Mars is interesting. He belonged to a very important black abolitionist church um, in um, Hartford. And he also um, belonged to the executive committee of the Connecticut Anti-Slavery Society. He was a fugitive slave himself who ran away from his uh, Virginian enslavers and was hidden uh, or rather ran away from his enslaved in Connecticut who wanted to take him to Virginia um, after Connecticut abolished slavery. And uh, he was hidden by, by many friends, including uh, white anti-slavery um, people in Connecticut. Um, we should know that Connecticut had one of the earlier abolition societies, the Connecticut Society for the Promotion of Freedom and the Relief of Persons Unlawfully Held in Bondage, and they helped implement Connecticut's gradual emancipation laws, uh, preventing people like Mars from being sold down south. We've heard of the Solomon Northrop story from the 19th century, now it's a big movie, but this happened all the time, and this, of course, happened uh, in the 18th century in Connecticut. Um, when it was a slave state gradually getting rid of slavery. And that process doesn't really get completed in Connecticut right down to 1848, even though the law is passed in 1784. So these, all these figures should be seen as an important part of the abolition movement. But once the American Colonization Society is founded, that was founded in 1816, um, it, it counted amongst its members some of the biggest statesmen in America, uh, senators, presidents, and their plan to get rid of slavery was to get rid of black people. They were going to colonize all free black people back to Africa. And African Americans and abolitionists really protested against this program, mainly because abolitionists, even the old abolitionists of the revolutionary era, always imagined African Americans as potential citizens equal citizens of the republic. That's what distinguished an abolitionist from someone who was main, mainly anti-slavery sentiment, saying, oh, I know slavery is bad. But an abolitionist was a person who not only believed in getting rid of slavery, but believed in equal citizenship rights, racial equality. That's what distinguishes an abolitionist from others. And I think it's important to remember that. So they really fought against the colonization society. And by the 19th century, African-Americans, whites like William Lloyd Garrison, uh, African-Americans like David Walker are protesting against colonization and putting forth the pro program of equality. 
But Connecticut kind of goes backwards. In its 1818 uh, state constitution, it pretty much disfranchises all black men. Even before that, the Connecticut state legislature had actually disfranchised black men. So here is an example of a state, the only one in New England, by the way, that disfranchised black men, that actually gave black men the right to vote, you know, and then took it away. Uh, and that becomes the kind of model for many other northern states who take away the right to vote from black men who, if they could meet property holding qualifications, could actually vote in the early republic. Uh, but on the eve of the Civil War, only uh, blacks could only vote in, in the New England states except for Connecticut. Um, now, of course, African Americans protested against these conditions. They protested against second-class uh, citizenship. At one of the most important churches, the Fifth Congregational Church, also known as the Talcott Street Church, because it was at that time located in Talcott Street, it's still alive, that church uh, and congregation. Um, many of its pastors protested against the increasing rise of racism, the disfranchisement of black men, and the spread of Southern slavery. I mean, slavery was not dying out, it was spreading, and African Americans were leading the charge uh, against um, both slavery and the disfranchisement of black people. Um, you can see this, one of the pastors here were Methodist minister by the name of Hosea Easton, actually wrote one of the first uh, intellectual um, uh, um, uh, um, sort of arguments against the pseudoscience of race that had become very popular. It was used by slaveholders to justify slavery, but also to um, justify the, the second-class citizenship, the denial of rights, public segregation of black people in the North. Um, uh, so did Reverend James W.C. Pennington, who's finally being recognized by Yale University. Uh, he was not allowed to attend. I mean, he he was not allowed to enroll for classes there. He could mainly sit in audit classes. Um, and he was eventually given a doctorate by the University of Heidelberg in 1849, the first black man to, to get one. He continued this tradition. He was a pastor at the Talcott Street Church. He taught in schools. And he also wrote um, uh, one of the first histories of black people where he tried to refute um, racism on an intellectual and moral basis. So he's an important abolitionist uh, to remember. Now, of course, you have heard of the Amistad Rebellion and how that rebellion begun by many Africans in 1839 in the internal slave trade of Cuba. Uh, eventually, this slaver is steered to Long Island and the case is tried in Connecticut. And this really galvanizes black and white abolitionists in in Connecticut, but it introduces in the 1830s and 1840s these slave rebellions, beginning with Nat Turner's rebellion, but also the Amistad shipboard rebellions like Amistad and the Creole, which came a little later than the Amistad, make abolitionists defend the right of the enslaved to rebel. Now, this is important because a lot of these abolitionists are pacifists. The evangelicals, the Garrisonians, they're all pacifists. Uh, they, they do not believe in violence. But when it comes to slave resistance, they defend it. I mean, Garrison is a prime example. He defends Nat Turner's rebellion. Now, he's one of two American editors to defend that rebellion, which is seen as very bloodthirsty and violent. But this idea that the enslaved people have the right to self-defense that they have the right to rise up against their own enslavement is an important thread in the abolition movement. So when John Brown decides to uh, go to Harpers Ferry and either smuggle enslaved people through what he called his subterranean passageway into the mountains or even begin a rebellion, this is nothing new. There's an old tradition within the abolitionist movement of this. Um, some of them begin uh, these missionary societies. Uh, this was being begun by Pennington. It was an all-black society when they wanted to take the Mendy Africans back to Africa as they demanded and actually um, uh, begin a mission in Africa. Uh, but they were very clear that they were not going to be confused with colonialism or imperialism. They wanted to have a, a, miss, a, a mission in Africa as the Mendy Amistad mission came to be known as the Mendy mission in Africa. Uh, and it involved a lot of natives. And some of them even came back to the United States 
uh, after the Civil War and preach to freed people, showing the sort of interconnections, very different from what we normally understand as the the missionary project associated with European colonialism. Uh, Pennington was also very important in refuting um, uh, what he called were laws that went against God's law. And he actually quoted this in one of his sermons in his um, uh, sort of critique of the fugitive slave clause of the U.S. Constitution and the fugitive slave law, where he says covenants involving moral wrong are not obligatory with upon man. He even said these were agreements with death and, you know, a covenant with hell agreement with death. This is all from the Bible. And Garrison picks it up to condemn the Constitution uh, for having the fugitive slave clause. So there's a lot of kind of rhetoric of resistance coming in opposition to the fugitive slave law. Um, and of course, we know John Brown himself was involved with this in, in Springfield, where he um, formed an all-black militia called the League of Gileadites, in which he tried to oppose the implementation of the fugitive slave law in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and this became quite common in the 1850s, when you have fugitive slave rebellions all over um, uh, the country, all over the North. Uh, we often forget uh, that the sort of fugitive slave controversies uh, involved uh, black and white abolitionists and enslaved people pictured here like Anthony Burns in Massachusetts or Joshua Glover in Wisconsin, which led the state of Wisconsin to nullify the federal fugitive slave law uh, or the Oberlin Wellington rescue. Um, some of these men end up joining John Brown on his raid to Harpers Ferry. So again, showing you that when we look at John Brown ultimately and his war against slavery, it very much comes from this long history of abolition, this long history of centering African-Americans within abolition. He's inspired by the Haitian Revolution, which is the first and only instance of a successful slave rebellion in world history. He's inspired by the slave conspiracies that are, and revolts that are taking place by the Jamaican Maroons who are fighting um, against um, the colonial administration in, in, uh, in Jamaica. So his war against slavery it comes out of these traditions from abolition. He's not some crazy person. He had his own family. I mean, his father, grandfather was a Revolutionary War soldier. So he, he knows, uh, he connects this rather with the fight for liberty for black liberty with this older revolutionary tradition. Um, and he is very much involved uh, in the abolition movement. He's not a lone wolf as he is commonly portrayed. He's funded by some abolitionists. He gives speeches to black and white abolitionists. Uh, a lot of black abolitionists, including Pennington, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman meet with him. Um, so he's not some sort of outlier, which is the way we normally see him. I make a extensive case for this uh, in my book. And I'm going to end with this because I know I have only 10 minutes. So I don't want to take up too much of my time. But and I'm sure you will um, be seeing some more inspirational films and hearing some more inspirational talk about John Brown himself and, um, you know, his birth in Torrington, his move to Kansas, um, and this this war that he starts waging against slavery throughout the 1850s, um, uh, ending with, in fact, uh, the raid on Harpers Ferry. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not a, a mystery why Union Army soldiers would march during the Civil War to the tune of John Brown's body, uh, because in a way they were carrying his fight down south. As he said, I'll take the fight to Africa. Uh, and uh, so they're carrying on that fight. They see themselves uh, as carrying on that fight, at least some of them do. And certainly that, that marching tune tells us that they do. Um, I'm going to end with this slide because um, this is um, a statue of John Brown from his last home in North Elba, New York. Uh, and, and I like it because um, a lot of activists associated with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and this is even before uh, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, this is when the Black Lives Matter movement started with the murder of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, 
Sandra Bland, a whole lot of other uh, black men and women, um, unarmed black men and women, many of them, and that they saw themselves as continuing the legacy of John Brown, which I find really interesting, right? Um, that this is this abolitionist struggle for black equality and black, uh, you know, rights is not something that sort of dies with the abolition movement or dies with John Brown's um, execution. He's widely viewed as a martyr in his times. His words seem timeless. Um, that many present-day activists should call themselves modern-day abolitionists uh, or modern-day abolitionists continuing the legacy uh, of John Brown's fight. Um, and, and for me, as a historian of abolition, I, I find that very interesting.